Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I think you made the right choice because today we're talking about pretty interesting stuff about autonomous driving and self-driving cars. But first of all, a few words about me. I do computer vision probably for 20, 25 years. Uh, 12 years ago, I founded some interesting company and we were pioneered some autonomous driving and autonomous navigation uh, research this company. I did a lot of uh, projects related to machine learning, AI, robotics, and right now I'm working at the Palm Systems, where I uh, coordinate the work of our computer vision center to do some intelligent automation stuff, but that's probably enough about me. So, I think you would agree that for the last years we are all are waiting for something like this. So one day we are go out of the building and such a beauty car smoothly arrived and the door is opened, we are settled at the back seat and we are reading, texting, watching something, and this car is bringing us to work, to home. But if you know uh, the state of the art, autonomous driving looks rather like something like this, kind of telling us, oh, wait, wait, I need another couple of years. I'm just learning to be autonomous. And uh, what is interesting, we are trying to build the autonomous driving technology maybe for, I don't know, 50, 40 years. And seriously, I will show you just one example. That's pretty interesting. And do you know what is it? It is a uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, created in the University of Munich in 1994, 25 years ago. And this car was able to run autonomously up to 1,000 miles on the public roads. It was able to speed up up to, let's say, 100 miles per hour. It was able to keep the lane, change the lane, avoid obstacles. And basically, it was able to do everything uh, what right now Tesla Autopilot can do. And, but from, the, from the, those times, uh, a lot has changed. For example, we have right now pretty much uh, CPUs, let's say seven nanometers. We have HD cameras, fast memory, fast uh, solid state drives, internet connection, various sensors, lidars, uh, cloud computing, computing. And else, probably you notice that we, um, what else we have here? We for sure have um, modern neural networks and uh, neural networks uh, today is a big deal for autonomous brain. But, uh, let's say 25 years passed by, and we're still at the same place where we've been for, uh, with this Mercedes-Benz for 25 years ago. Why is it? Uh, let's imagine we are investors, and we have, let's say, $100 million, and we want to invest this money into self-driving company. So we bring our engineering team and ask them, is it really difficult to build a self-driving car? And many engineers would say, no, that's not a big deal. We'll take the popular uh, neural networks from the GitHub. Uh, we'll train them a bit. They will recognize cars, will recognize road signs, um, uh, will recognize lanes, and we probably will add a couple of the radars for just for the safety, and we're all set. And we say, oh, yeah, that's great. And maybe in six or 12 months, we really have some, something working. And we're starting to test it. And at the beginning, everything is going just well, so we can detect everything our car is keeping car lane, uh, detect other cars, um, can speed up, slow down. But soon we will understand that the road conditions and the weather conditions could be a little bit different. For example, like this, or like this, or maybe in our city, like this, for example. And here probably the first time where we say to ourselves, oh, Houston, we got a problem. And here's the two problems. First of all, uh, we all know that for the machine learning, for the neural networks, we uh, should have good data sets, data sets. And probably you would say, but how to get these data sets? And what to label here after all? But we will skip this problem just for a while. Another problem is that we soon will understand that our eye is a really unique optical device. First of all, because it's um, optical resolution. The optical resolution of our eye is about, let's say, uh, 120 megapixels. So for the couple of eyes, we have 250 or something. And moreover, uh, when our eyes are working together and working together with our brain, so the effective resolution that we can achieve, according to some tests, is about 500, 600 megapixels. Just compared with our full HD or 4K or 8K resolution, that's, that's just nothing. And another problem is that uh, our eyes have really incredible uh, dynamic range. So we can, um, we can see at the daytime, at some dim, uh, dim light, uh, twilight, at some sunshine, and no uh, camera on the market is able to do this uh, in this way. 
maybe only now we are trying to achieve something similar uh, in our latest phones like Google Pixel, Huawei, Apple, uh, Apple 11, Apple iPhone 11, uh, when we are using several cameras, when we are combining the uh, different images into one. But that can be used into autonomous driving right now. So what can we do? Uh, not too much, but maybe only something like this. So we are trying to bring uh, a lot of sensors to collect more data. Here you can see this really funny picture from Uber because it's one of the first uh, their prototypes when they uh, bring everything they could bring to uh, put on this car. You can see the matrices of uh, cameras looking at different sides, uh, several lidars, ride, radars, and everything is mounted on the top, in the bumper, into the mirrors, and so on. But here we have another two problems. First of all, uh, the cost problem. For example, this car probably costs around 40K in the US. And let's say we put it all together and we bring all this stuff that costs another 40K and we say, yep, we have our car that's basically pretty similar uh, to what we had before, but it probably can drive sometimes at once. But just in case, now this car costs around 80K. That's, that's not good. And another problem is that uh, today, uh, now we see that uh, we should hire more expertise. We should hire more engineers just to install, integrate, support, maintain all of this hardware. We need to develop new models that will process the data from these uh, sensors. So the com overall complexity of our system uh, starts to grow really fast. But okay, let's say we somehow solve all these problems so we don't have, don't have any problems with the sensors, sensors. And the next case. So we are driving. And we're approaching this car. So what, what can we see? Obviously, we see a car and a couple of bicycles. And these bicycles are trying to cross our, cross our way. Yep, we don't, well, don't want to kill cyclists, so we are breaking an emergency. But obviously, it is not what we're supposed to do in this situation. Or in other situation. For example, again, we are driving along the highway, and we uh, see this bus. What we see? First of all, we see the speed limit, 60. And we see the attention kids uh, sign. So our um, uh, autopilot tends to uh, follow the rules. So we slow down to 60, and we're just waiting when the speed limit is over. And we are driving, and we are driving, but the speed limit is still here, and it's still here. Behind us is a long way of angry cars. They are honking. Again, something stupid. Uh, or maybe just look uh, at this problem until a little bit more general. Um, this case. This is actually exactly what, what I, the case I get to uh, quite recently in my vacation. So what do we uh, see here? Obviously, we see cows, but wait a minute. We were developing the self-driving. So why cows? Maybe we should, OK, we can add cows to our data set. But next time, it would be horses. Or next time, it would be sheep, dogs, cats, I don't know, deers. OK, probably we should add every animal to our data set. But next time, it would be some fallen tree some just bunch of snow, some heap of leaves, or maybe the car, we got the car behind us and from this car some fridge just falls uh, on the road. So uh, should we add everything we can see on the road in every condition uh, to our data set? Maybe we should, but we just can't because we don't know how this uh, neural network uh, capable to uh, detect all the objects uh, around the in our world uh, should look like. So. Here we understand that our vision system should be much, much more uh, complex. We should not only uh, detect objects, but we uh, should have some fast, fast 3D, reconstruction, uh, 3D reconstruction model. We should use classic computer vision algorithms to detect some objects that just cannot be detected, like uh, some snow, some water on the road, and so on. But, okay. Maybe we solved all these problems so we can see, we can understand the full context with these funny cases, with the bicycles, with the speed limits, with the cows. But the next. And the next problem, probably the most important of all. We are planning our uh, trajectory. And we should be able, uh, we should be sure that uh, at the place where we are going to move uh, at the next second, we will not find anyone else. We will not find other car, pedestrian, some bicycle, some scooter. So we should be able to uh, predict what all these objects around us, what all these actors will do at the next moment. And this is the most tricky part because 
uh, that means that we should have some model that will describe the whole wo world around us, that will describe how uh, every driver could behave, what uh, it will describe the buses, trucks, bicycles, dogs, cats, balls, kids, and so on. And many, many engineers uh, say that probably this is the most and most tricky part because we simply don't know how to build these models that will predict the behavior of uh, the world around us. But okay, we were, were talking about the software. But what next? Next, we'll find that we simply don't have hardware to run all of this. Because yes, we have GPU, we have uh, fast CPU, we have NVIDIA, and so on. But um, for the autonomous driving, we need to a uh, little, uh, little bit different. First of all, for sure, we need good performance. That's, that's obvious. But we need, uh, we really need low latency because uh, even, even 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds is, 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 really, um, uh, is really too much for us. We uh, need the latency about maybe 5 milliseconds, 5 milliseconds 10 milliseconds. And uh, for these purposes, our, our platforms that we can find on the market just simply don't work. And many companies uh, have nothing to do except as, for example, uh, Tesla did this year. They developed their own hardware. They own system on a chip with everything they need. So uh, on this system on a chip, you can see the neural processors for uh, fast neural networks uh, processing. You can see here GPU, codex, uh, security chip, the cluster of ARM cores for general purpose pro uh, processing. And just notice, we were talking about self-driving, but we right now are turning to be a chip maker. That was a little bit unexpected. For sure, uh, many companies as ARM, NVIDIA, Huawei, NXP, they are trying to address this problem, but if we want to have something really competitive uh, right now, so we have no other choice as to maybe develop some kind of our own proprietary hardware. And now we probably can sketch up our autonomous driving architecture. So we should have perception module that will do our object detection, some distance estimation, 3D reconstruction, classic uh, image processing. And this module should work with our variety of our sensors like radars, sliders, cameras, and so on. We should have uh, the model for understanding that will understand the full context and all these funny cases with, uh, uh, with um, I don't know, cows on the road, some dogs, and so on. Uh, we should have here a localization mapping, so we should work with GPS and with the digital maps. We should have a prediction model that will predict what uh, all these uh, cars uh, and objects around us will do and how they will behave at the next moment. And we should uh, have the, actually, the uh, planning module that will, uh, recon that will um, construct the sequence of the commands that we will pass to our vehicle, and we will uh, need to have some, some feedbacks from these sensors. And at the middle, we have our hardware that we actually don't have right now. We have cloud interface, uh, human automation interface, and all other stuff. So this is really, really, uh, really complex. And um, looking at every of these uh, component, probably you uh, would notice that we just don't know how these uh, tasks should be solved. So we are just trying to find the best ways how to address every of each task. But anyway, let's see how, how these uh, problems are solved today. Uh, first of all, we have right now maybe two big families, or two ways. Uh, let's call them Tesla way and Wymo way. Wymo here is a, is a Google, actually. So first, companies like Tesla, like uh, Cadillac, they say, okay, we will do it incrementally. So we will, uh, today we have our uh, driving assistance that's able to, for example, keep the lane, and the next version will have our assistance that's able to change the lane, then we'll add some, um, some possibility to cross the uh, crossroads and so on. Uh, at the same time, the companies like Waymo, Yandex, Lyft, Uber, they say, oh, no, no, that's simply, that's not right. You should build consistent autonomous driving technology and only then put it on, to the market. Uh, that's pretty interesting to see this discussion. And actually, there is no right or wrong approach. Um, but uh, anyway, that's uh, how different companies try to uh, reach this uh, point of full autonomy today. And uh, the RAM basically two, two really big, two really big and important uh, problems that all these companies should to solve. First of all, data sets. Remember, we are uh, we're talking about the data sets and where we can uh, 
get these data sets for all weather, for snow, thunder, I don't know, the data sets for all these uh, cases uh, with animals on the road, with boxes on the road, the key data sets for the human behavior or the driving, driver's behavior. And um, Wyman says that, for example, we will use simulation. So we will use computer graphics and we will simulate the, all uh, what we need and we will learn in this simulated environment. And uh, really, uh, right now they have 25K uh, uh, simulated cars that are uh, running and learning uh, in 24-7 mode. But right now they have only 100 miles uh, uh, driven in real, uh, on real public roads. And look at the same on Tesla. Tesla says, no, that's, that's, that's impossible. You just cannot uh, simulate the whole world around us and you need to use real data sets. And indeed, right now, they have uh, half of a million uh, autonomous driving cars already running on the public roads. And all these cars, every day, are collecting the data sets for them. They are collecting data sets. They are collecting test cases. They are uh, learning uh, all this time. For example, because if you are driving Tesla and even if your uh, autopilot is turned off, it's not actually turned off. Uh, the autopilot uh, makes his prediction. Uh, he compares what you do with what uh, was predicted and um, it, in co constantly learning on all of these uh, cases when uh, using the, what actual, actual, driver, actual driver does. And right now they have an uh, incredible, incredible number of uh, 1.5 billion, 1.5 billion real uh, miles um, driven on a public road. So 1.5 billion miles driven in full autonomous mode on public roads. That's, that's incredible, and that's really, really big advantage for the Tesla. And another problem. So when we were discussing our um, architecture, we, we mentioned that uh, right now we just, we simply don't know how all these uh, modules should be implemented. What should be a neural network that will uh, predict the behavior of, uh, of other drivers? Uh, what should be a neural network that will reconstruct our 3D objects, what should be the behavior to process this data from the uh, radars and so on. And the um, big hope here uh, with the AutoML, so you probably know that AutoML is an approach when we not only uh, train our neural networks, but at the same time we are trying to search for uh, the architectures of our neural network. So for example, that's, that's from Weimar. If you have some task, so you define this task, and you set some restrictions, and then you do uh, some relatively fast uh, training pre uh, cycle. So you, uh, you search over 10K architectures, you train them, you, you evaluate them according to uh, accuracy, uh, according to the performance. Then you have your 100 models that you consider as the best candidates. And then you do full training. And at the end, you have uh, your, uh, your champion that will be chosen for the further processing. And that's interesting because uh, the whole uh, machine learning and the whole data science right now is turning to be more and more out of mail uh, approach because right now um, because right now probably we don't have or we soon will not have the engineers that will uh, that will design the neural networks manually and uh, the most uh, the most demanded will be to uh, how to establish this process of out email uh, is most in the most efficient way because it's uh, really expensive it's time consuming and um, and so on but that's that's uh, but autonomous driving let's say is a really big driver for out email development and okay so i told that probably we had no significant uh, significant progress for the latest 25 years but surely that's not true and we made a lot of progress. Today you can test uh, Yandex uh, robot taxi in Skolkov or in Inopolis here in Russia. You can uh, test Waymo or Lyft or Uber in some cities in the New York, for example, in Pittsburgh, in Dallas, and so on. You can um, see, the, um, see the test cars from main uh, car makers that are being tested on the public roads uh, in many cities over the world. And What's interesting here? Um, do you remember the time when we uh, have first personal computers? It was maybe 30 years, maybe 40 years ago. Yes, these computers were not so capable as today and was a resort for the geeks. But today we are working at the industry that was actually created um, by the personal computers. And I think that uh, 
something similar will happen uh, with uh, autonomous driving. Because right now, you see uh, these logos uh, from the companies that are forming this new ecosystem. And uh, as with personal computers, we probably will not have uh, vertically integrated companies that uh, build everything for the autonomous driving. We'll have some companies that, um, that uh, develop the hardware, some com companies developing the operating system, some companies developing the uh, software modules, and so on. And uh, as I mentioned, probably that's not a good idea to uh, to build a startup in autonomous driving right today. But what is really a really good idea is to look uh, into this field and see what niches could be occupied by, uh, by you or by your company in future, in the next uh, 10, 20 years, because we'll probably have a lot, a lot of new niches for the development. And uh, for example, let's say in the Palm, we are seriously looking into this field we are doing now um, not a lot of, but some projects for the automotive industry related to connected car, to human to machine interface, to big data related to uh, data collected uh, from, from these cars. And I think this uh, direction inside IPAM will be growing pretty fast next years. And that's interesting that uh, initially this slide is supposed to be the final slide, but uh, when I, I thought to myself, why, why the end? Because uh, right now, we are on the doorstep of maybe a big turn uh, in our industry. And the autonomous driving industry uh, will create new workplaces, will create new, uh, new, will create new expertise, will create the demands for the new engineering efforts. And I decided that the right side should look like this, because uh, today is not the end. Today is just the beginning of autonomous driving. But that's the end of my speech. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Большое спасибо, Вадим. Вопросы? Вы можете задавать по-русски или по-английски? Well, uh, I will continue in English since the whole presentation was in English. Uh, you didn't touch the topic on autonom autonomicity of these cars because uh, even if we have a perfect driving car, considering from like uh, whether a human would do, the car would be capable to do the same. It is uh, also important to understand how car would make a decision and planning uh, if we're talking about how it behaves on the street. I believe you know many examples on uh, what, what decisions should car do based on ethical point of view. So do you have any heuristics or um, maybe um, any ideas how you should approach this problem? Uh, so, so we understand correctly the, the question about so we are learning on the real cell, uh, on the real uh, drivers that are driving our cars, and uh, how will we um, how will turn this uh, this behavior into into the algorithms, let's say, or or not? Mm. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. So uh, as I mentioned, um, that's that's pretty interesting because this is a field that we mostly know nothing because we just don't know how the this autonomous car should look like. And many companies, they are going a little bit different ways, and they, uh, so actually, right now, we're just experimenting. And so, so idea, as I mentioned, that yes, so we, they actually, these companies use a lot of experiments, uh, like AutoML, like uh, some tests, and so on. Uh, so this is a kind of, um, so the new, new approach to engineering. So we do not, uh, do not design, design algorithms. We maybe even don't know how these algorithms work. We're just trying to set some learning environment and let our autonomous car to learn in this environment. But how it will work at the end, we just don't know. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I didn't see any mention of uh, Baidu company and uh, their product of uh, Apple uh, open uh, operating system for self-driving cars. And uh, in my opinion, it is quite um, quite big uh, event and quite big, uh, quite good technology uh, example. When a big company opens uh, their technologies, their simulators, their data sets, probably their code and so on for public usage, and this can um, help a lot to um, everyone who wants to enter to this area. Uh, but uh, their platform is not very uh, it's not very open 
source, I would say, because uh, you need registration on Baidu, and for some data, uh, for some data, you need to write them mails and requests to get them and um, disclose all the information about you, what they want. And my question was about um, that per perspective of uh, cooperation platforms. Uh, in your opinion, will we see in the nearest future any really independent cooperation platform and uh, how it could like? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, yes, so with, uh, with the Baidu with an, and with the Apple project, that's an interesting question. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the major companies do not use too much, or maybe at all, uh, the Baidu platform. Uh, so if you're some independent startup, probably it's, it's a good idea to try to uh, enter this um, Baidu collaboration and to use their, uh, their resources and so on. Uh, but what, what about co cooperation? So for, for example, you know that Audi. Audi has their own uh, subsidiary company called uh, EAD, Autonomous Intelligent Driving. And so uh, this company is developing right now the autonomous driving technology for the Volkswagen, for the Audi. Uh, quite recently, a couple of months ago, they were uh, um, joining together in this force with Argo AI. Argo AI is a company that um, fully belongs to the Ford. And uh, this um, joint company will uh, develop the autonomous driving technology for all the Volkswagen Group, of the Volkswagen, Ford, as I understand, for BMW. So there are, there are not like an open source, maybe, collaboration, but some private collaboration between the companies is filled basically between the automotive companies. Вадим, спасибо большое за доклад, очень интересно. Вопросов два, они больше технические. Первое, с точки зрения машинного обучения, где узкие горлышки были, там, например, разметка датасета или подбор моделей архитектур. Второй вопрос, где узкие горлышки в, ну, вот в мощностях да, там, вычислительных, то есть вы про DDR4, например, говорили, почему вот именно такой поток данных должен быть не меньше? Uh, ну, значит, uh, значит, по поводу узких горлышек. Ну, узкие горлышек, собственно говоря, два. <laughs> собственно говоря, два. И вы их оба упомянули. Это, во-первых, датасеты, самое главное узкое горлышко. Uh, потому что, ну, наверное, действительно сейчас вот Тесла является самым большим таким носителем датасетов для авто автономного вождения, благодаря тому, что у них есть такая вот флотилия из 500 тысяч машин. Uh, конечно же, вы знаете рекапчи, да? Вот когда вы ходите на какой-нибудь веб-сайт, uh, Google просит вас обозначить, обозначить, где все светофоры, где все автомобили, где все мосты. Google Google пытается собирать эти датасеты немножко другими способами. То есть у них есть, конечно, и своя программа по сбору датасетов, но они пробуют использовать свои сервисы, чтобы набрать вот этот необходимый объем. Ну и второе, да, это AutoML. Ну, как вы знаете, например, опять-таки мы говорили по поводу по, про Tesla. У Google есть своя, так называемая, TPU, Tensor Processing Unit Platform, которую они, в общем-то, разработали ну, именно для того, ну, по части именно для того, чтобы активно развивать вот, обучение своих нейронных сетей, свой AutoML. И ну, это, наверное, такой второй горлышко. Почему, почему там было про объем данных? Ну, вот Tesla говорит, что, значит, у них их платформа должна обрабатывать, значит, по-моему, порядка 20 или 30, сигнал с 20 или 30 камер, 4К, 60 кадров, нет, не 60, кажется, даже 120 кадров, что-то такое. То есть, собственно говоря, они вот как бы вот, когда разрабатывали свою платформу, они сказали, что вот, вот мы посчитали, что нам нужно столько-то, и мы, исходя из этого, прикинули, это, в общем, не то, что мы собираемся кому-то продавать и предлагать, это наша проправитая штука, но вот нам ее хватит на ближайшие там сколько-то лет, а дальше мы разработаем следующую архитектуру. Но, в принципе, это некие такие референсные значения, на которые можно смотреть, наверное, потому что они, видимо, сделали большой ресерч перед этим. Здравствуйте, большое спасибо за доклад. У меня немножко такой вопрос в сторону от именно разработки. Вот вопрос как раз предсказания движения и вообще развития дальнейшей ситуации, он в конечном итоге, наверное, перерастет в вопрос организации движения. И если предположить, что у нас в недалеком будущем будет большое количество машин или большее количество машин именно с той или иной системой управления, то логично просто в рамках города уже организовывать их движение и взаимодействие этих машин не на уровне, что каждая машина сама по себе решает, как ей двигаться в дальнейшем, основываясь на своих там, тех или иных разных, от разных производителей систем, а по сути нам нужна некая система управления городом, ну именно в рамках трафика. Есть ли такого рода разработки, знаете ли вы, и ну, по сути это все упирается уже в понятие 
то, то, чем у нас занимается правительство. Да? То есть это должны быть какие-то правительственные программы по разработке систем организации дорожного движения, состоящего из автоматических автомобилей. Есть ли такие разработки? А, это интересно, что у меня, кстати, тут был в, в первой версии слайд. А, рассказывать про то, что как в Америке тестировались а, такого рода разработки в 50-х годах. А, в 50-х годах, соответственно, прошлого века, General Motors, а, они тестировали так называемую Smart Road Infrastructure, когда движение автомобилей действительно контролируется при помощи специальных там, радиодатчиков и все остальное. А, в чем тут проблема? Почему тогда технология это не пошла? Почему сейчас, собственно говоря, мы этого не видим? А, дело в том, что, в общем-то, мы тут говорим про бизнес, по большому счету. И а, какая мотивация у бизнеса? Например, у Теслы мотивация продавать больше своих автомобилей. И вот они делают это для этого. Ваймо, Яндекс, Убер и так далее, они хотят стать такси-сервисами. И они хотят экономить и избавиться от этих водителей, которые требуют страховку, зарплату, все остальное, с которыми сложно, которые не выходят на работу. То есть есть четкие бизнес-мотивации. Когда мы говорим о неком таком инфраструктурном проекте, то тут возникает сразу слишком много, скажем так, стейкхолдеров. Это правительство, регуляторы всякие. И как оказывается, потому что, конечно, нужно все сертифицировать, нужно привести к какому-то виду, это все кармейкеры должны об этом договориться. И, в общем-то, выяснилось, что проще начать и делать все это самим по себе, чем вот пытаться все это огромное число заинтересованных сторон собрать вместе. Но а, мы, безусловно, скорее всего, к этому придем, потому что вот следующим этапом развития это будет унификация интерфейса между машиной и машиной и интерфейса между, да, условно говоря, дорогой и и, тем самым, и автомобиль. Ну, то, что, опять-таки, мы посмотрим, но все эти автомобили так или иначе пытаются ориентироваться на дорожную разметку. Зимой дорожной разведки, разметки нет. Ну, по крайней мере, у нас в стране нет, и там, где есть снег, нет. А, опять-таки, если уже у вас есть умный автомобиль, у которого есть все интерфейсы на борту, то, в общем-то, вам достаточно просто сертифицировать или как бы стандартизировать вот этот метод обмена данными, чтобы они не сталкивались друг с другом, сделать умные светофоры, добавить туда чипы какие-нибудь. И, скорее всего, это будет таким вторым, вторым этапом, может быть, там, через 20 лет, не знаю. Но, скорее всего, так и будет. Вот я хотел бы только добавить, что это неизбежно, потому что сейчас вот только монстры в духе там Яндекс, Google, да, крупных компаний в состоянии позволить себе разработку э, таких систем. Но как показывает практика, да, что проходит какое-то время, и какие-то решения, пусть более простые, становятся более доступными, и, грубо говоря, вот как сейчас уже можно в домашней лаборатории, ну, домашней, заниматься там каким-то синтезом своих генов, там что-то такое творить, да, есть уже даже open-source проекты на эту тему, точно так же и системы управления автомобилями, они расползутся и будет все равно большое количество таких автомобилей, от этого нет. Поэтому так или иначе задачу придется решать в рамках города. Просто мне кажется, что это будет такой немножко другой уже... То есть, может быть, и правительство надо будет сделать как-то более электронным. Ну, вот я, я как упомянул, что действительно тенденция такая, что все это будет похоже на то, как развивались персональные компьютеры. Первые, если помните, компьютеры, там Альтаир, какие-нибудь Atari и так далее, это были такие интегри... и вертикально интегрированные компании, которые делали все. Сейчас мы имеем компании, которые делают у нас материнские платы, процессоры, операционные системы, там, мониторы и так далее. И, собственно говоря, вся эта экосистема распадется, видимо, на такие вот кластеры, компании, которые делают отдельные компоненты, и она, по идее, должна себя как-то регулировать. И когда это станет дешевле делать на уровне вот такой инфраструктуры, тогда, наверное, это вот тогда и появится. Вадим, uh, hello. Um, so I have, I've got a few questions. Uh, the first one, when you, when you were talking about uh, the animals on the road problem, uh, you said that we have, we have to or we should uh, train different models for each animal. Uh, can we just, can we just uh, like train it for a moving object on the road? Uh, should we train it for a uh, Like uh, each animal <laughs> separately. Yeah. 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 That, that's that's an interesting question. So uh, let's take this case with the cows. So I got into this situation. So uh, again, we for sure we should have some fallback scenario when we just detect that this is an obstacle and we just stop. But what next? When I meet this cow, so I just honk it. I just move slowly down, and this cows after some consideration moved away. But let's say we are uh, with an uh, autonomous car. So we see some obstacles, we stop, but what we should do next? If it's a cow, probably we should go a little bit forward, but if it is a stone or tree. Uh, so that's uh, really important because, for example, we have maybe a blind man in this car or a kid, and, if, and after all, this car probably will not have a driving wheel, so, we, so this car should be able to handle all this situation. And this, uh, Uh, this requires us to more or less understand what to show with this obstacle. So maybe not the detect this is a car or this is a rabbit, but to understand in general how to handle this situation. That's, that's pretty interesting. Well, if it's moving, that something is controlling it, because, you know, a rock doesn't move and a tree doesn't move, right? And as you said, it, it can be a, an old man, yeah? Well, eventually an old man will get out of the road. Uh, hmm? A sleeping dog. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, well, okay. The, the next question is, like, you know, con qu quantum uh, computers are coming and processors as well, quantum processors. Um, so you said uh, now it takes a lot of computational power, yeah, for these uh, autonomous cars. Will uh, quantum computers solve the problem? Uh, and so I believe then eventually these autonomous, uh, the costs, the price of autonomous cars will drop. Uh, will autonomous cars replace the usual cars we have in our ordinary life, like every day? Uh, I think yes, and I think that maybe in 15, 20 years, maybe it will be forbidden for people just to drive cars manually, like with, with, um, with, uh, with the guns. So yes, the car is really dangerous, and the, arm is, uh, and the gun is really dangerous. So maybe it will be allowed only to a certain group of people to drive cars uh, manually, because it will be really safer if all the cars around us will be uh, self-driving cars. So maybe yes. It's coming. The future is coming. Yeah. Большое спасибо, Вадим. Я думаю, остальные вопросы можно будет задать в куларе конференции. Спасибо. Небольшое организационное объявление.